Hey, good morning, church. Uh, for those of you watching in the line in the Richmond campus, Williamsburg, you don't know this, but we lost power temporarily <laughs> at the, uh, the Corbin campus. I mean, didn't the praise team do just a great job of just continuing to lead us? Oh, man, that was, that was wonderful. And I was just enjoying that moment and worshiping the Lord with you and with our team and my wife leaned over with me and she said, where's your iPad and your notes? And I was like, oh no, I, didn't. I left them in my office. So then I just went back to my office and uh, man, the Lord is in control, right? I, I'm reminded of what Pastor Brett said in our introduction, even today, uh, quoting Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, fear is w- when you think you're in control, right? <laughs> and, uh, but you put everything in God's hands and his control and there's nothing to fear. Uh, I preached a sermon two weeks ago on the issue of identity. The title was, Who Am I? And in that sermon, we talked about the lies of the evil one. Often things people might say of us or things that kind of stick to us, even from our childhood, that really impacts who we are. But when we know who we are in Christ as believers, we understand that we are accepted, we are loved, we are chosen by the Father, that we have a purpose in life, that we are forgiven of our sins. No matter what our past says, our future in Christ is forgiven, and we are valuable to God, and the cross is the extent of that love. The cross is a picture of how much the Lord loves us. Well, uh, Brad Rhodes preached last week, and so we're going to pick back up uh, today on identity on this issue. And I think if we could resolve this, if we could really have a deep theological understanding of who we are in Christ, who we are at the very core of our being, our person, then a lot of the other problems that we have in life will subside, we'll have strength and courage to press through the difficult things of life. Uh, But just for a moment, uh, let me give a a strong plug for Grace Marriage. It's a marriage ministry that we're launching here at Emmanuel. Uh, When you join up to be a part of Grace Marriage, uh, we'll meet four times a year. And the first one uh, is coming up here at the first of March. And uh, you, uh, you can come to, hopefully you come to all of those. Maybe you can't come to the first one, but you can still be a part of Grace Marriage because you can attend the other three that are going to be scattered throughout the year. Uh, the problem with, with marriage is that life is just so busy. And we get busy spinning plates. We really don't have time to work on our relationship. In fact, most of us have not worked on our marriage since we were married We worked on it before we were married, and we worked really hard at courting our spouse and trying to woo them into a relationship. And then once we said, I do, we began to focus on other things. So grace marriage is an opportunity four times a year to gather together, and and you're going to be led, I'm going to be led. Robin and I have signed up for this. We can't wait to be a part of this. We know this is going to make our marriage stronger. It's going to make our marriage better. It's going to make us better parents. It's going to help us shepherd you better. Uh, when the most important relationship outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, your marriage, is strong, and then everything else around you is stronger. Conversely, if your marriage is weak, If your marriage isn't all that God intended it to be or what it could be in Christ, then all the other relationships around you with your kids, with your friends, with co-workers, they are not as vibrant, not as life-giving, not as fulfilling as what God meant them to be because everything begins with your marriage relationship. Now, Oftentimes, you'll go to a weekend conference, maybe you'll hear one sermon and you'll hear some good things about marriage. Uh, but you don't re- really put it into practice in your marriage. You know, they, they say you forget 90% of what you hear. Now, that's pretty discouraging as a pastor because I do a lot of talking. I don't even get to choose the 10% you remember in a sermon on Sunday morning. You probably remember the announcements, you know I mean? And, and so when you come together with Grace Marriage, it's not a lecture for four hours. Man, how boring that will be. No, it's we come together and we're going to be led Uh, by individuals from our church that have gone through the training with Grace Marriage. And you're actually going to work on your marriage. You're going to have time as a couple to see real progress in your marriage. And maybe maybe you're engaged. This this is a ministry for you. If you're going to be married within the next six months, if it's longer than that, you should wait to the next sign up. 
If you've been married 40 years, this ministry is for you because you're going to be able to add a lot to these sessions, but you're also going to see that, that your marriage is going to be richer and stronger because you spend time on it, not just time on other things. Now, some might say, well, the cost, man, it's $200. I mean, it seems like a lot. It might seem like a lot at one time, but just know this, if money is a barrier for you, the church will cover your cost. We believe in you so much. We believe in the foundation of marriage, which God established, that we'll do whatever it takes to help make your marriage stronger. Just let us know. But to think about it as in four dates. We're going to give you the best four dates of your life. If you go out to eat and you go to the movies and you get popcorn and some chocolate-covered raisinets, which is our personal favorite, you're going to spend $50 on that date. So we're going to give you four dates, $50 a date. And at the end of those sessions, you're going to see your marriage growing. And you're going to see some real progress and some issues that you had perhaps your entire marriage and you haven't been able to resolve. So please come. You can sign up today. You're going to have more information on that later. But back to our sermon for today. My name is uh, George Allen Bonnell III, officially. Most people know me as Allen. Last week, I was walking across the campus of the University of Cumberland, and three of our students uh, yelled out, hey, George, you know, and one of the students says, George, why are you calling him George? I'm like, well, that's his name. That's his name. And, and oftentimes, the, at the very basic level, our identity is our name. And oftentimes it says something about who we are, and other times it doesn't say a whole lot of who we are. Growing up, I always hated the first day of school. Because you know when you walk into that classroom for the first time and they take attendance, you know what happened to Alan. They'd be going around, George Bonnell, here, I go by Alan. And I, I had to have that conversation every day, the first day of class. And then once you get to middle school and you're changing classes every day, I, did, I had to do it six times a day, seven times a day. George Bonnell, present, I go by Alan. All the kids, they'd look over and kind of snicker at me. And, and you know, I had no authority to change my name. I wish I could have just changed my name. It was such an ordeal to do that every year. And it's not that I didn't like the name George. It's just by the time you're the third, you know, my grandpa was George, my dad was Georgie, and I was Alan. You know, didn't want to get confused. But I had no authority to do that. Only my parents had that authority. And I was known by Alan. Everywhere I went, if ball team, the coach would call my name. And, and that was who I was. That's who I identified with. When anybody called out that name, it could be someone I think of Alan Miller I went to high school with. And somebody would call out Alan, we'd both look. Because that was our identity. And our parents gave us that name, that identity. And they're the only ones that have the authority to do that until, unless you turn 18 and then you can change that. With the basic level, only God has the authority to give you identity. God gives you identity. Identity is a sign to you. The title of today's message is, Who Do You Think You Are? We're going to be in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. If you'd like to turn there, we'll be there in just a few moments. Number one in your outline, write this down. Designed by God. So who do you think you are? Foundationally, we need to understand that we are designed by God. He created us and infused in us His image. We are image bearers of God, each and every person. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says... So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female are both made in the image of God. It is not that man is made in the image of God, and then woman is made in the image of man. No, that is, that's not what the scriptures tell us here in chapter 1 of Genesis. Everyone is made in the image of God. We are image bearers. When we are creative... We are simply displaying the unique design that is on each person because we serve a creative God. When we are loving to other people around us, even when non-believers are loving toward others, it is it's not their identity, but it is literally the image of God coming through and showing the world what God is like. We are image bearers. We are a window for which people look through and see what God is like. 
And because each person is created in the image of God, intrinsically we have value. We have value. It doesn't matter your belief. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic background. It doesn't matter your political persuasion. That every single person on planet Earth, seven billion and growing, each and every person is valued by God. Each person bears the image of God. That's why we should show respect to all people. It is interesting. Whenever God created the world, he created stars and he said it was good. He created the animals, said it was good. He created the land, the seas. After everything that God created, he said it was good. But after he created you, after he created man, after he created Adam and created Eve, he said it is very good. That understanding, as the psalmist writes, we are just a little lower than the heavenly beings. That you are special in the eyes of the Lord. When you see a sunset, many of you have gone out west over the last couple years, I've noticed on social media, and you see the grandeur of, of the world in which we live. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. When you see the beauty of creation, it is all inspiring and it is, it is evidence that there is an intelligent design, a creator, God himself, that did all of this. And yet, when we look at each other, there should be greater inspiration. When you look at, at the creation, the, the, the climax of all of God's creation, the apex of, of the creator of the universe, when he said to you and to me, it is very good See, you outshine the most splendid of sunsets. The the, the most extreme of landscapes, you outshine because you bear the image of God. I love to go to the zoo. The monkeys are my favorite because they're always up to mischief. I love to see the, the different kinds of animals from the hippopotamus to the giraffe. And I could spend all day at the zoo, and yet, you are far more exquisite. You are far more interesting. And you are the only thing on this entire earth and this entire cosmos that will last for all eternity. Only three things last forever. God's word, people, and God. They will last for all eternity. You are the apex of God's creation. And yet we are bombarded with low self-esteem and we are bombarded by a world that says you've got to look a certain way and you've got to achieve a certain status to have value. And yet when God created man, he said it is very good. Before he did anything, before Adam started to take care of the garden, Before he started to love his wife Eve, he said it is very good because identity is received, not achieved. You don't achieve value. You don't achieve self-worth. No, it is ascribed to you by God himself because you are an image bearer. You reflect God and the, the greatness of God through you. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, God the Father spoke from heaven. And he says, this is my son whom I love. In him I am well pleased. Before Jesus did anything during his earthly ministry, God the Father expressed love to God the Son. Because identity is received, not achieved. He was not loved because he was going to do all these miracles, not because he submitted in the Trinity to God the Father to go to the cross, to suffer a cruel death, to abolish the slavery of sin and all the penalty and death of sin. No. God the Father, in the uniqueness of the Trinity, expressed love to God the Son before any of that happened. Psalm 139, verse 13. 
For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. This is, this is evidence. This is theological text of why the believer believes a, abortion is abhorrent to God. Because while mom and dad might have an accident, no baby conceived is an accident. But every child is loved by the father. Every child, no matter how long we may have with them or how long we might not have with them, they are knitted together in their mother's womb. And you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I think of how often times adoptions from around the world, a child is adopted and they have some difficulty. They're born with some kind of ailment, some kind of deficiency, some more severe than others. And yet, you will never lock eyes with one infant that is not fearfully and wonderfully made. Never will you see a child or an adult that does not bear the image of God. Now, this is a different sermon for a different day. We understand that sin has marred that image, and we are not perfect image bearers. But that is not the purpose of our sermon today. Number two on your outline, write this down. Shaped by others. We are image bearers. God designed us. He gives us our value, our identity. But we are shaped by others. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they fell from grace. And what did they do? They hid their shame with fig leaves. Because they lost their identity. Because sin marred their perspective of who they are. The Bible says in Genesis that they hid their sin in Genesis chapter 3 with fig leaves. And that's what we do. We hide our insecurities by trying to be great at work or... Uh, by the amount of money that we make. We, we, we try to puff ourselves up and to look good to the world around us. And it's just fig leaves. We lose our job and the fig leaf falls. The relationship is on the rocks and the fig leaf falls. Whatever it is that you find value in outside of Christ is a fig leaf. That you are trying to hide your shame and your guilt and your sin. We let people define us all the time by words. We are damaged by words spoken to us like daggers. We are damaged and wounded by unspoken words. Words that should have been spoken to us by parents or fathers or moms. That we are loved, that we are needed, that we belong, that we have what it takes. So many men in our world when, when, does a, when does a boy become a man? Is it at 12? 16? Is it when they leave the house? Is it when they get a job? Is it when they're first with a, with, with a, a, a lady? When, when does a boy become a man? As the African proverb says, you sit down a boy and you stand up a man. Is it what the Swahili believe that once you kill your first lion or when you go out into the the bush and you stay all night by yourself and once you are able to do that, you become a man? No, it is spoken. It is nothing achieved. It is received by our dads. And if you don't receive that from your father, it can't be achieved. It is received. Don't worry. Because your heavenly father will give that to you. He will speak into your life and say, you are a man. You have what it takes. You are strong and you are courageous and you are bold and you have what it takes. Often lies from the enemy wound us, destroy us. He is called the father of lies. The only thing the devil can do to a believer is lie to you. He has no power over the believer. He can oppress you, but he cannot possess you. He does not have that power. But he will speak lies to us. Lies to our very being. We're going to address that in just a moment. How we counteract that. And the effects of this 
fake identity, this pretense, this facade that most of us carry around our lives, we either shrink back like a turtle in the shell when things get hard, things get difficult, or when, when our value, when our person, when our identity is attacked, as men, we often become angry. We fight. We throw words at the other person. When it's attacked and our, our wounds are pricked, we come out fighting. We, we have a dog named Oliver who's a mutt. Those are the best dogs. I mean, it is, I mean, Oliver is the, I mean, it is a quintessential mutt. I mean, it, it has like 10 different dogs in it. I mean, I have no clue what this dog is, but it's so persistent in getting out of our gate. It, we have to put pins in it. It learned how to knock the pin out, so you got to put the pin in the right way. And, and then between the gate and the post, it, it began to use its head to get through. It would like, it would push apart the gate somehow. And it gashed its head. It was the most grotesque thing I've ever seen. Put peroxide on it. What would this dog do? It would go again. It would, it would butt its head up against his post. And it just kept opening the wound over and over again. Because it wanted freedom. It wanted out. And we do the same thing. We butt our heads over and over and the wounds just keep coming back and they never heal. And when they don't heal, what happens? The scars come. And then those scars, they just, they, they, they just wreck our relationships. They wreck our lives. They steal our joy. And then for some reason, for guys, we think our value, our identity is in our job. And then we retire. It's like, oh man, I don't have nothing to do anymore because that was our identity. Oftentimes with ladies, it could be in relationships. It's a husband or kids or family. And then the family, some tragic thing happens and a family member passes away, a child moves away. And all of a sudden we don't know who we are anymore because our identity was wrapped up in that person. Some of you have probably have seen the statue of David sculpted by Michelangelo. Arguably, it is the greatest work of art on planet Earth. It sits 17 feet tall and was sculpted out of pure marble. It was first commissioned in 1466. But most people don't know it wasn't commissioned to Michelangelo. No, it was another artist that took on the project. A number of years passed and not one chisel hit that a labyrinth piece of marble. There were a few marks made for the leg to go here and the arm to go there, but it was so overwhelming, they couldn't chip anything away. A few years later, another artist was then given the job. He too couldn't come up with anything. And then it was finally just put to rest. And then 10 years later, another artist came in, same song, same story, same dance. They were just so overwhelmed. And then in 1500, Michelangelo, at the ripe age of 26, starting to develop quite the reputation as an artist. And he was commissioned. He was shown this huge block of marble that was in the uh, Florence there in the cathedral. And when he saw it, historians tell us that he was so unimpressed by it. As it sat out and it had weathered all those years, it had grown some discolored. He really didn't even want to use this piece of marble. But because it was so expensive, he began to chip away. And within two years, and just two short years, this 16 feet, 11 inch tall statue of David from the scriptures was revealed he was asked, well, how did you know? How did you know what to chip away? With everything that was done and everything that was said and everybody had all these problems. And he simply said, that's easy. You just chip away the stone that doesn't look like David. <laughs> that's what God does with us. God made you unique. Before the foundations of the earth, he made Rick and he made Allison, and made Joey, made Cody, 
had been in mine, had Daniel and Hannah in mind, before the foundations of the earth, before he spoke the world into existence, ex nihilo, God spoke out of nothing. God didn't need any raw materials. He had Chad in mind. He had Natasha in mind. That you are unique. There's no one that has a fingerprint like yours. No one has an eyeball like yours. There's a uniqueness to the shape and the body and your appearance and the, your personality that is all shaped and crafted by God. A number of years later, in 1967, Charles Seymour wrote a book about Michelangelo's David. It was called Michelangelo, The Search for Identity. That's what we are all doing, searching for identity. Judges chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abazite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Let's just stop right there. There's an incredible phrase here, beginning in verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord. Uh, it, the angel, angel of the Lord is preceded by the definite article, the any time, you see the definite article before the angel of the Lord in Scripture. It is God himself. This is not an angel. Angel simply means messenger. And we see the, the angel, definite article, appears several times in Scripture. And you're going to be convinced by the time we end this passage why. But let me just help us to understand why we understand this to be actually what's called a Christophany. A Christophany is an appearance of Christ before the incarnation. A theophany is just the appearance of God himself. Anytime we see the angel of the Lord, he identifies himself as God. He also exercises responsibilities of God. Also, we see whoever the definite article, angel of the Lord, appears to, they are fearful of this. After the incarnation of Jesus, we never again see the angel of the Lord. Why? Because it is Jesus. We know who it is. And he came and he sat down under human characteristics here portrayed in God. And Gideon, what is he doing? He's beating wheat in a wine press. Now, for those of us that aren't farmers like myself growing up in Louisville, you do not beat wheat in a wine press. What do you do in a wine press? You make wine in a wine press. You take the grapes. So why was Gideon in a wine press, he was hiding out, and the Bible says he was hiding out from the Midianites. The Midianites were warring people against the Jews. And whenever it was harvest time, they would come on and they would steal all their crops. They would come in, they would let the Jews do all the work, and they would come in and raiding parties and overpower them and take all their wheat. It's kind of like one of those old westerns, right? They'd have all those steers coming, and, and these cowpokes, they'd come and they'd steal the cattle. That's what the Midianites would do. They would come in. But Gideon is hiding out below this wine press, and he's threshing wheat. And I can just imagine every now and then he looks over the horizon to make sure they're not coming. He's scared. He is fearful. He needs this food to raise his family, to survive, to eat. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now notice in verse 11, he sat under. In verse 12, he appeared to him and literally the Lord is with Gideon. With him, he says, the Lord is with you. Literally, the Lord is with you. Not, not abstractly like, oh, God be with you on this project. May God's favor be upon you. No, the Lord is with you. The Lord is in your presence. Oh, mighty man of valor. Do you think Gideon felt like a man of valor? Hiding in this wine press, threshing wheat. Worried about the Midianites perhaps coming and invading I don't think he felt like a man of valor. I think he actually probably felt like a man that was a little scared, a little nervous, very timid. And Gideon said to him, now notice, he is ascribed to the Lord to be a mighty man. 
Not just a mighty man, but a mighty man of valor. But notice what Gideon says of himself beginning in verse 13. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if, how often we start our sentences like that, if, if I was only strong enough, if I was only smart enough, as I, if I was born somewhere else, if I, if I had a mom or if my dad hadn't left. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? He saw this. What is, he said, that's of days gone by. It's no longer the case. But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. So here he is. He's already surrendered to the Midianites. The Lord himself has given us into their hands. He is resigning to the fact to a defeated life. But notice what the Lord says in verse 14. And the Lord turned to him. Again, we see these human characteristics portrayed in God. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? Can you hear God speaking into this man's life? that he is strong, that he is mighty, that he is valor, that he will save Israel. And yet more excuses in verse 15. And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Those things, many ways, on first appearance were true, right? I mean, it is a small clan. He's has a small family. We think these of ourselves often, right? I'm not not smart enough to do that. I, I, I didn't have this education. I didn't have that opportunity. And, and we, we tie our future to our past. We, 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 we limit what God wants to do in our lives today and tomorrow and ongoing based upon where we come from, who our parents were. The education level we have, the lack of education level we have. And when we tie it to these things that the world says are important, all the while God is saying, no, I've chosen you. I've equipped you. I will enable you. I will use you for my purposes. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you will strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes and show me a sign that is you who speak with me, please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present, my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will stay until you return. Verse 19. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes and an ephra of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and unleavened cakes and put them on a rock and pour the broth over it. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and unleavened cakes and fire sprang from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Fire sprang up from the rocks. Fire came from nowhere. There was no kindling. There's no flint here to start this fire. There's no match. The Bible says that God is a consuming Fire. One reason why we know this is a manifestation of God himself and the life of Gideon is this very picture of a consuming fire. When the temple was finished and they brought the sacrifice in, God sent fire from heaven and consumed the offering. We see that numerous times in scripture. Again, perhaps one of the most famous you might be familiar with is Elijah. When Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and he made his sacrifice and he prayed to God and what did God do? But God sent fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, to consume the offering to the Lord. The fire represents the power, the presence, and the holiness of God. Verse 22. 
Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God. Now he calls him at this point by his proper name. For now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's crying out to God for God to not destroy him. Verse 23, but the Lord said to him, peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Now, now why does God tell Gideon, well, you should, shall not die? Because in Exodus and in other places, God says that you cannot see him face to face and live. He says, if you see me in Exodus 33, most, you will not live. You cannot see God face to face and live. In John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, No one has ever seen God but, one and the, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side and has made him known. So Gideon, understanding at this point that he has been face to face with God, thinks that his life now will be taken. But it's not God the Father, it is God the Son it is the incarnation of Christ. Christ did not begin in Bethlehem. <laughs> he wasn't born in Bethlehem. That was just his entrance into the world. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says that all things are being created for him and by him. Jesus created the world. It, it was through Christ that the world was created. The Trinity coming together in perfect harmony, each during their part, yet one in three persons. Throughout this text, you can read further in the book of Judges of Gideon. You will see that Gideon struggles with who he is. He was defined by the Midianites. He was defined by his current situation. The Midianites coming in and raiding parties, taking everything that they wanted. But God spoke into his life for who he really was. Number three, Write this down. We are healed through the Father. Over 150 times in our Bible, the Scriptures tell us that we are in Christ or we are in Him. We are chosen in Him. Uh, we are accepted in Him. We are baptized into Christ. Over 150 times in the Scriptures, it, it is telling us, it is speaking over us who we are. Why such redundancy? Because we are inundated by the world that we live in, speaking lies to us, telling us something that other than what we truly are, that you were created by God, that you have purpose and meaning, not because of the job that you hold, not because if you have kids or don't have kids, you don't have value or purpose or worth if you're married or not married. No. Our identity is in Christ and Christ alone. That you are designed by Him, created by Him. And He is perfectly sufficient to fulfill every need that you have. And your identity and who you are is rooted in who your Father is. Your Heavenly Father. And he will bring healing and strength. Second Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 7, we see this interchange with David and uh, the grandson of Saul, Jonathan's son. And, and he is worried that David is going to take his life. He was crippled at birth as the nurse was running with him, and he fell, and his foot was broken and never healed. He'd been on the run from David. In fear. In verse 7, the Bible says, And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should so regard for a dead dog such as I? Can you see and just hear what he thought of himself? And King David, who is a picture of Christ, he is a picture of God in the Old Testament. 
Verse 9, then the king called Zimba, Paul's, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belong to Saul and all to his house, I've given to your master's grandson. It's as if he totally overlooks what he thinks of himself, calling himself a dog. Instead, he restores him to royalty. He restores him to the kingdom. And all the days of his life, he's able to come into the banquet hall of the king. And he's no longer seen as an outcast. He's no longer seen as a crippled, as a guy who can't work, can't do anything for himself. He's not an outlaw. No, David restores him completely and fully. I've, I am convinced that many of us need healing from the Father today. Over things done to us, things said to us. If not, we'll just continue to act out in anger and strife and bitterness. In Tolkien's epic tale of Middle Earth, King Aragon, he is described as the, it says, the hands of a king or the hands of a healer. King Aragon, he returns from a long exile. No one knows that he is the true and lasting king. And he sneaks into the castle. Unlike you and I would think of a returning king should come in triumph with parades and banners and coming down the center drawbridge. No, he sneaks in the back door. He has every right to that kingship. He has every right to the victory as Tolkien writes. But instead of arriving like any warrior claiming the right as king, he makes his way through room to room to the sick and dying. He healed his people, cleansing their wounds with an ancient herb, calling them back to life, and even whispering into the ears a fair more light of knowledge, love kindled in his eyes to say, what does the king command? His token is trying to paint this picture of, in his epic trilogy, the Lord of the Rings, of our coming king, Jesus. He, he doesn't come crashing in through the front door. No, he comes in silence oftentimes. And he comes not demonstrative, demanding that we just bow down and worship him. No, he comes to us in our wounds and our brokenness. And he heals us with the gift of salvation. He strengthens us. He embraces us. And he says, you are mine. I love you. And in you I am well pleased. If you've never trusted in Christ, today is the day. If you've never experienced the grace of our King and Savior, I encourage you today to lay down your pride and to come and repent of sins and put your faith in our Lord Jesus. Others of us are here today, and man, we've been broken, and we've been beaten up, and we think because of things that have happened to us that, man, we're never going to get to where we could be, and that is just not true. Identify the lies of the evil one and replace it with the truth of God's Word. He longs to bring healing to your hurt and woundedness today, but you have to take that first step. You take that first step of just saying, I need help. I need healing. I need direction. I need wisdom. I need strength. I need courage. And he is our ever-present help in time of need. Would you stand with me as I pray? Lord Jesus, God, we thank you for your love and your mercy in our lives. And God, just like you came to Gideon, God, you came to us. You came to us in our hurt and our brokenness. And God, this journey began of healing and redemption. God, we understand that it is, salvation is not a one-time deal. But once we repent, God, we have a new identity. We have a new mind and a new heart in Christ. We're no longer enemies of Christ, but 
We are now friends through the cross. God, I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus that is above all other names. God, that you would set us free this morning to respond in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.